evening. My name is Erin Gersten Zhang, and I'm one of the co-organizers of today's event, along with my co-organizers, uh, Ansley Sluss and Jennifer Deal. We are so grateful that all of you are here today, and it brings me so much joy to look around the room and see so many familiar faces. We are here today to have a conversation about how to improve the workplace for women. And it's a conversation that we're all already having, right? We're all having this conversation in private with our peers, with our friends. And while it's important to have that conversation with our peers and our friends, the problem with only having the conversation there is that our peers and our friends tend to look like us. They tend to have similar experiences that we have. And they tend to agree with us on a lot of our opinions. And so when we have these important conversations and we only talk to our peers, we end up recycling the same idea over and over again, just different versions of it. Uh, today is about having newer, better, and smarter ideas. Today is about having this conversation in public. And we hope today is about inviting disagreement and debate. Because it's only when our opinions are challenged and we hear new ideas uh, that we get to those better and smarter ideas. Um, so today we ask three things of you as part of this conversation. First, we ask for honesty and candor. You know, one of my favorite things about planning this event has been getting to meet with fantastic, accomplished, and brilliant women, and to have the conversation with them individually. And not just our brilliant women who are on this stage, but the many, many awesome women who have their fingerprints on today's success. And something that came up in every one of those conversations was that inevitably, one of us would say something along the lines of, well, I would never say this in public, but, and then they would share that really smart, important opinion that we truly have, right? Today we have, and we're going to have about 100 women in this room, and we owe it to ourselves and to this topic to share our actual, true opinions. Because for too long, we haven't shared what we really think. The second thing I'm going to ask is that we do invite debate. We invite opinions that we may not agree with, that may be uncomfortable to hear because that is how we challenge ourselves to leave this room this afternoon with those better and smarter ideas and bring those ideas to our community. Because if today proves anything, it proves that the fact that there's this many women in the room to talk about this, that every single person in this room has the ability to influence our community and to make the change that we want to see. And then finally, the third thing we ask is, I think it goes without saying that in a room full of primarily women, we will be respectful of each other's opinions, but I ask more than just respect. I ask that we come to this conversation with an open heart, and we agree to assume that when we do hear those opinions that we might disagree with or they're hard to hear, that we agree that we assume that they come from a good place, because all of us share the same desire to improve the workplace for women. Now I want to um, welcome some special guests that we have. Uh, not only do we have women from our community, but we also have a bunch of young women from um, two high schools, Atlanta Girls School and Paideia. So I want to thank you ladies for coming. Um, we're here to talk about the future. Yes, thank you. We're here to talk about the future and what we're going to leave for the next generation of women. So your voice and you being here is really important to us because you are very much the future. Um, now, many of you, as I look around this room, are extroverts, and I know you'd be extroverts, so you won't be shy about raising your hand and joining this conversation, because it is a conversation. Um, but for those of us who may not be as extroverted, we're going to use technology to make sure that your opinions and questions are heard. So I want everybody to take out your phone, and I want you to go to this URL that's listed at the top of the slide, go to your browser. Just take a minute. Okay, 
So what you're going to be able to do is you can type, you can post anonymous questions and comments as the conversation goes throughout this morning. Um, and I will be moderating those questions and comments from the audience and bring them up as appropriate. This is not to discourage you raising your hand and actually saying it out loud, um, but there may not be time for that or it may not be the right moment. So I do want to encourage you to use that tool. And my co-moderator, Jen Downs, she will be running um, the conversation from prepared talking points that we have. Uh, but we do welcome your opinions, and we hope that you join us. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jen Downs. Is it not, is everybody having the, it's not up. It's <laughs> awesome. Um, Yeah, I'll get it up and running. Jen's going to... Hi, I'm Jennifer Downs. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm the founder of a company called Aggregate Law, where you can post jobs if you're a law firm to look for freelance attorneys. And we really love um, working with women, sort of founded to put women back to work, women lawyers back to work. So um, this topic is near and dear to my heart. Um, and I, am, I have the distinct honor of helping introduce our panel here which I'm going to put the onus on introducing themselves. They're going to have to introduce themselves because we have um, a special request that I believe they've been warned about, which is I'd like you to introduce yourself and tell us about your professional life, but also give us something that we're not going to find on an online bio or your LinkedIn page. So with that said, I'm gonna, we're going to start with Shelly. Great. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Shelly Sunnerfit, and I am a... Um, family lawyer turned psychotherapist. After practicing family law for 15 years, I realized I enjoyed the counseling that we inevitably do as family lawyers more so than litigation, so I decided to go back to school and make a shift. And I am now in private practice in Midtown, where I specialize in working with folks who are dealing with a family law or other legal issue, as well as with attorneys who are dealing with the challenges of this profession. Um, and I'm delighted to be a part of this conversation this morning. Um, I'll tell you, because it may come up in this conversation, for 20 years I was a lobbyist um, under the Gold Dome. Um, I represented nonprofits advocating. Is that not on? Yeah. Oh! I, I thought I was not maybe quite as loud as I normally am in here. Um, so I served as a lobbyist for nonprofits advocating for women. And so as you might imagine, I had some interesting experiences at the Capitol um, uh, working on those issues. Um, and the thing that you wouldn't find on my bio is that I uh, am always looking for new ways to manage my scoliosis. And the thing that has helped me the most is Iyengar yoga. Um, so I just have to put in a plug for that because it's been really transformative, as well as something called the Feldenkrais method. So if any of y'all are dealing with any kind of sort of structural uh, issues, particularly back pain, I'm happy to come talk to you about something that might help. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Feldman Sheff, and I am a faculty member in women's gender and sexuality studies at Emory. Uh, just am new, relatively new to Georgia. Just moved here a couple of years ago after 25 years in New England. Um, I'm a philosopher by education, uh, and quite surprisingly found myself in a WGS program. I do a lot of interdisciplinary work, and I'm a legal theorist as well. Um, I'm not a lawyer, but I would I actually really want to be one. <laughs> um, so what can I tell you about uh, myself that you may not, all, that you can't find online? Um, I uh, grew up working in my parents' candy store in Greenwich Village for 10 years. There we go. Good morning. My name is Gwen Keese Fleming. Uh, and I currently serve as a partner at a boutique law firm in Washington, D.C. called Vanessa Feldman. We uh, focus on environment and energy law, uh, and I bring to that also a little bit of cybersecurity and litigation based on the careers that I had before this first step into the private sector. Uh, so for 23 years, I was in the public sector serving uh, as a prosecutor for 17 of those years, particularly as the elected district attorney in DeKalb County, uh, first woman, first female elected to that position. Um, I first started running for office 20 years ago, it's hard to believe, but 
Um, and we can talk a, bit, a little bit about how things were then and how different they are now. Back then I was the only. Uh, now you have several uh, female district attorneys around the country and several female uh, solicitor generals as well. Um, after that, I served in, in several positions with the Obama administration, including uh, the regional administrator for EPA here in Atlanta uh, and chief of staff for the Environmental Protection Agency under Gina McCarthy. Uh, so looking forward to the discussion today. And the little known fact about me is 25 years ago when I graduated from law school, I was honored and humbled to accept a scholarship and recognition from Gaul. So that was my first entree into the organization and it's kind of nice to come full circle and come back. Good morning, everybody. I'm Meg Taylor. I'm Associate General Counsel at Delta Airlines, and I head up our Employment and ERISA Compliance and Litigation Group with um, over 80,000 employees. We tend to keep things pretty interesting, um, but I, uh, I really enjoy my job there. Things you might not uh, find about me online, um, I love to play tennis. I'm not particularly good at it, um, but I love to play. And um, I am a, a passionate advocate against human trafficking and participate in um, Delta's uh, very widespread efforts in that area. Good morning. I'm Dawn Smith. I have my own small law firm where we are all women. There are four of us who are lawyers, and then we have two paralegals. Um, I do primarily family law, but also represent children with special needs, get educational services. Um, my path has been interesting in that, and, and I think it's important because I've seen um, being a lawyer in lots of different spaces. I clerked for a federal district court judge for a number of years. I was a community organizer in low-income housing um, developments before Obama was a community organizer. I'll just add that. I, um, I worked at um, a private firm. I was at a nonprofit where I was in a leadership position, served as an administrative law judge, and then was in a mid-sized firm with four men's names. Um, so um, the interesting fact that I'll tell you um, that I told Aaron is um, I can deadlift 240 pounds, <laughs> which I told my husband means that I'm um, strong enough to drag his dead body out of the house. <laughs> so, without witnesses, right? There is a DA in here, so. <laughs> This is going to be so much fun, I can already tell. So um, let me set the stage for this first panel. So we've met, we've met our panelists. The first panel, as you can see on the slide, is you cannot change what you cannot see. So the goal for this panel is to talk about where we've come from. Um, where, where are the places over time, over this last, say, I don't know, maybe 100 years is too far, maybe 50, um, where have we come from? Where are the places, where are the victories? But where have the places, more importantly, maybe for our conversation today, where are the places where we have gotten stuck? Where we need to go back and do a little more work? Because, um, you know, that's why we're all here today. This, this conversation is out in the, in the ether right now because we know there are places we've gotten stuck and we know there are places we need to go back and, and get it maybe more right. Um, so with that background, that's where we're going to come from with all of our talking points this morning. So I'm going to introduce some talking points and we're going to kind of head down the line and get everybody's take on them. And um, like Aaron said, aim for honesty and an open, generous way of hearing all these responses so that we can really learn something today. So we're going to dig right in and, and go right for that elephant in the room, which I think is this conversation that's being had at least at least when I go out and read articles and when I'm talking to my friends about what is the line between something that's just distasteful and something that's harassment. Um, when we're talking about in the workplace those lines matter because of the consequences and all kinds of other reasons and then involved in that is also women's agency in all of this. You know, what are the, you know, is the woman a victim or is there more agency there? So I'm going to Start here with Shelly, and we'll head down the road and go from there. Thank you. Um, 
I guess I have not a very um, clear-cut answer to the question of what is distasteful. I think it might vary for each of us. And I think that can be empowering to think that we can each set the boundaries for what's appropriate um, behavior in, in the workplace and outside of it. Um, it could also be a little scary, right? Because that does put some of the onus on us to help define that. Um, but I think it's something that we need to be clear about, that for too long we were in the position of sort of having to take whatever came our way. Um, I uh, can tell you, having started working at the state capitol when I was in my 20s, um, I, I was subject to quite a lot of inappropriate behavior, and I didn't feel that I had the agency at that point to say, hey, this isn't okay. Um, I think that has evolved some, although probably not as much at the Capitol as it has in other workplaces. Um, but I, I do think that women have the responsibility um, to, to say, that's not okay, actually, for me. Because if we don't use our voices and speak up about it, how are the guys ever gonna figure it out? I mean, sure, the law gives us some parameters, but more likely, it's the conversations we have in our everyday lives that aren't necessarily governed by the law um, that are gonna help effect cultural changes. So I would just invite you to begin thinking about where that line is for you and how you might articulate it both in the workplace, which I recognize is more fraught, as well as in your own relationships, in your own family of origin, uh, with your neighbors and friends, because that's where cultural change, I believe, will really begin. Thanks. So this is a... Uh... So this is a, a bit of a tough question for me, um, and I think my initial impulse when I was hearing about a lot of these things last fall was, you know, just suck it up, right? And I think, um, I, I think that's actually a really problematic response. Uh, and so I guess I want to step back for a second. I promise not to mansplain, but I was given a little bit of permission to do that. Um, and I actually want to say that, it, in fact, I think where that line is drawn has less to do with the line itself than the way that we perceive folks who were talking about this and complaining about this. Um, that often what we're doing is putting ourselves in their position and saying, well, if I was in that position, this is what I would do. So you all need to suck it up or not suck it up. Or I was in that position and no one listened to me and, and no one's listening to these folks. So, I mean, I think a lot of where this line is has a lot to do with our own blindnesses about other women, um, about other folks who are in that position. I think actually one of the worst things we can do is to put ourselves in the position of somebody who's complaining because we judge others by that same standard. Now, this is probably completely antithetical to the way you, you deal with stuff in a courtroom, um, but I am a philosopher, so I guess that's where I want to kind of start with. Um, and in part, this is, you know, this is probably going to be my answer to a lot of these questions um, for the rest of the morning because the panel that we're on, you cannot change what you cannot see. In fact, that was really what I've been thinking about um, as I was preparing uh, to be here with all of you today. I mean, sexual harassment is not a new issue. It's been here for hundreds and hundreds of years. And yet we haven't really, many of us, have not taken it seriously. I mean, sexual harassment, sexual assault, and rape were in fact commonplaces in the lives of black women under slavery in this country. Um, and they were also charges that were attributed to black men who were lynched in the 18th and 19th centuries. And so part of what you see and the 20th century, right? So part of what we're seeing is the way that we judge people based on whether or not we can identify with them. And the way that we judge men based on whether or not they seem like somebody who's part of our family. And I think we have very different standards there. So I think I'll talk about this more in response to the next question. But so I guess I want to pull back and say I'm not really sure that that's a straightforward place to begin this conversation. Um, so I too was thinking about the the question or, or the statement, you cannot change what you cannot see, um, in terms of agency. I think, uh, well, let me back up. I agree. In terms of trying to define what's distasteful versus what's harassment, that's a very difficult 
uh, thing to define for anybody because it does rely a lot on uh, the person who's experiencing whatever that um, action conduct is uh, and the extent to which they are able to uh, raise their voice and explain what it is or, or just put people on notice as to, to what it, they deem to be inappropriate, I think um, is difficult if they are the only one or one of a few uh, in a group. Um, and I can go back again, I, I had said that I was um, the first African American woman district attorney, elected district attorney in the state of Georgia. And this was just, I don't know, in 2004. Uh, but I found it interesting that when I ran, when I got pregnant in 2006 with my first child, the AJC actually did an article indicating that my maternity leave would be a disservice to uh, the citizens of the county. So you step back and think that how can you have agency or raise your voice in that type of environment? There weren't other uh, external validator groups or anybody else that could do kind of a counter editorial. And I think you have that now. So even if um, the individual who is being victimized um, does not feel as though they can speak up, I think by virtue of the fact that things have changed, women, it, most professions, most, I'm not going to say all, are more integrated. You've got leader, women in more leadership positions. That helps um, raise the confidence level for folks that, that may be shy about speaking out. And then again, it's upon us that are in leadership positions to make sure that that door stays open uh, and we don't start either blaming or putting our view of what we've overcome to get to where we are on those that are still on that journey. So I, I agree things have changed dramatically. We have um, more and more women in the workplace, uh, more and more women um, in leadership positions. Um, we have corporations that are more attuned and committed to diversity and inclusion. But I guess when you ask yourself the question, you cannot change what you cannot see, what is it exactly that we're talking about? What is it that we cannot see? And I think that one of the great benefits of the hashtag MeToo conversation is it's causing people to have this conversation and to talk about things that have happened and, and raise awareness about the volume of women who have experienced um, some sort of you know, harassment or uh, sexual assault or other mistreatment in the workplace. I think one of the one of the drawbacks of the conversation, however, has been a tendency by some to conflate the very worst of the conduct, the Weinstein rapes, with the more um, ambiguous um, off-color comment or flirtation. And the fact of the matter is we live in humanity, we are humans, and we all come with warts. So if the conversation is causing us to believe that suddenly there's gonna be a shift in corporate America and in our workplaces around the world, and suddenly everybody is going to magically be transformed and nobody's going to have to be um, subject to an uncomfortable comment or an uncomfortable encounter, um, that's just not realistic. So as women, we need to figure out ways to use our power. And I think the best way to do that is first to be absolutely excellent in what you do so that you speak with credibility. And second, you've got to establish relationships with people so that when things are happening that need attention, you can help either address it for yourself or address it for somebody else. And how we choose to address that matters. So we could pull the fire alarm and have a fainting couch every time you know, somebody said something that offended us. That's not helpful long term. It's probably not even helpful short term. But if we can use our relationships and our power and our voice to bring people in and help them see why their behavior or their comments or their treatment is not right 
and help begin to shift um, how they engage, then we are helping ourselves out and we're helping our peers out immensely. So I'm, I'm a big believer that this is a continuum as well and that um, there is clearly illegal activity, right, that we've sort of been clear about. The Supreme Court's really struggled with it for years, but we've sort of been clear about it at this end, all the way down to what we're hearing about in all the Me Too the, and, and, and the, the hideous things that have occurred, along with the other things that made us feel demeaned um, or otherwise takes away our dignity in some way. I also am a big believer um, in a pendulum, you know, that sometimes it's got to swing way up here so that it can settle back in the middle somewhere. And I think that, that what we're going through right now is really important in letting, validating ourselves and each other, but also I can't tell you the number of men that have come to me and had conversations around I had no idea, that have taken me to lunch, that have sent me letters. Um, I had no idea. They, what can I do? Um, so I, I think that pendulum will, will end up somewhere here um, eventually, but I think it's, it's got to be swinging high where it is. And then the last thing of what is it, I cannot change what I cannot see. For me, it's simply if you judge me, interact with me, um, or otherwise approach me based on my gender rather than my worth, right? So if your first response to me in the courtroom or across a board table um, has to do with me as a woman and how I look um, and um, it continues that way, then, then I feel like that's a problem. Uh, so our tools, I've been running, everyone. No, it's um, we do no, have one it was. question. It's, it it yeah, was, but it's not anymore. Oh, now it came back. So it's coming and going, okay. basically. Okay. So when it's working, please post your questions, because they're coming through. Um, and one of the questions that we have is what, what when, when we see it, and I think a lot of the panelists have answered about us personally, but it also extends to, and we want to think about this throughout the conversation, is like, what is our duty also to our fellow um, peers? And when we see it happening, not necessarily to us, um, but we see a culture, or we see it happening to other people. Okay. So let's let's draw, draw that into our second talking point, and also just in an effort to make this a little more conversational. So if there's something that you guys want to respond to each other about, let's we can do that this time. I failed to mention that the first time. <laughs> you know, we don't have to be so in a line about it. So um, I want to, before we get too much further, and it came up a little bit during that first round, but I want to make sure that we account in this entire conversation um, for the differences across class and race. So we're going to interject that into this next, this next sort of um, round of conversation. So let's, let's bring that into the conversation. Let's respond to one another if you had something you needed to respond to on that first round. And then let's also talk um, a little bit about the piece that, that you just brought up, Don, about um, where we are, um, where, or where we've come from, where this, the legality lets us down. Like, this isn't all going to be illegal, right? Like, we don't have rules for all of this. We can't just say, you can't do that. So, um, I mean, I believe you, there was, a, there was an article. So maybe, well, maybe we can speak to that and then bring the, the race and class piece in. Well, and, and I'm not sure I'll get to the article. I, I, there is something. I, I do feel like setting a context in Atlanta um, in the legal community. Because many of you don't know that in the 80s, there was a Supreme Court case of Hishon versus King and Spalding where a woman sued over not being at it. She, she was represented, she'd make partner in five or six years. Um, she, the EEOC, which makes you file a claim in 180 days from when it happened, found that she had a claim and it went all the way up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court upheld um, that you can have a claim in that type of contract. But way back then in the 80s, um, women were not treated the same way in partnerships. We went through the 80s and 90s where there were two events that occurred where there was a wet t-shirt contest, and I kid you not, for summer associates um, at an Atlanta law firm, 
Um, there's some of the ladies that will nod and remember that. And then there was an event about summer associates in hot tubs with partners and um, things not being appropriate. And that was the 90s. So I, I, I think it's, you know, and I thought, silly me, that my mom had fought this fight. I really thought my mom had already fought this fight. Um, so, you know, that was in the very recent past. And to think that we're going to become completely enlightened um, in the legal community, I just want to put it in context. I, I, I think that's high hopes. And um, to, to reiterate one of the things you said, um, if you file a claim, you mm -hmm. have to do so within 180 days. So talking about the systemic injustice that's inside of our system, right, that discourages bringing these things up. So bringing that into the conversation a little bit too, why don't we take on this, this piece about how are the differences uh, um, along class lines and gender, I mean, I'm sorry, class and race. You want to start, Elgini? Um, you, you look like you had something to say. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. Happy for you to lead the way. Um, actually, I want to kind of uh, come back to the question that, that Aaron and Jennifer, you had just mentioned about, you know, what's, what's our responsibility um, to look out for others? And I mean, I think, again, I'm going to reverse the lens and just say, why is it that we don't automatically look out for other women? And I don't think that that's, I don't think that, I'm not saying that as a way of kind of blaming us, mm -hmm. but actually saying I think there are really important structural reasons, right? Often um, our allegiances, right, are to our employers, mm -hmm. our family members, um, our sons, our cousins, our nephews, our uncles, right? Folks who actually um, either in positions of power, who pay us, and who at some level, right, are, are really kind of part of that structure that make us feel like we're not in alliance with other women because we're vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Our jobs are at stake. Um, and there is some, you know, this real sense of, well, what happens if I speak out? What happens to me? So that's one thing. But I think the other thing here is that that's actually, I think, intentional. That's part of this kind of systemic way of dividing women. That this isn't, women are not necessarily automatically going to be intimate and close and tight. And so we really have to think about why we're not interested in other people folks' victimization. I mean, before the Me Too thing came, was publicized by Alyssa Milano, Tarana Burke had, in fact, coined this hashtag 10 years ago to talk about women of color who were sexually assaulted in different kinds of communities. And that really missed my radar, missed a lot of our radars. And so that's actually a really important question. Why is it that this is coming up at this particular moment? And I think part of it is, at least a lot of us, and I'll put myself in there, you know, we, we really identify when gorgeous white women with money, right, are harassed. That's what we identify with. And we also, and I think part of the shock behind Weinstein and others, less Weinstein, but I think part of that shock is also, well, at first, before all these stories started coming out, was just the ambivalence, because he's a rich, powerful man. How could he possibly have had to do this? And so I think part of it is we have to look at our own really problematic assumptions about who could be guilty of this and who could be victimized by this and how we're complicit in that as women. There's a lot of pain. I think that's painting a pretty unfair. Ten years ago, there was not social media the way there is now. And I also think that as a society, we are highly sensitized to President Trump. And therefore, had, had Ms. Burke had that platform on Twitter in 2018 instead of at the very beginning, or 2017, instead of at the very beginning of Twitter, then she may have been amplified. Um, and I just, I think that's an important thing to look at, is why, what was happening outside of our control last year that forced all of this to the top. And so I think that's, that, that's part of the conversation that we, we talk about this. Instead of saying that we didn't hear it 10 years ago, how many of you were on Twitter 10 years ago? Well, but if I, if I could respectfully you. disagree, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think you're right, and obviously technology has changed, and it's, it's easier to get information out in this day and age. Um, I think the crux of the issue is, for me at least, and again, this is a very, um, I'm going to be real, this mm -hmm. is a very sensitive topic mm -hmm. for me, 
um, because while I'm thrilled that more attention is being brought to these issues and women as a whole are being given a voice, there is a slight part of me that is also um, bitter that, you know, women like me have been speaking out for years, mm -hmm. maybe not through the most advanced technology, which goes to the class issue, lack of access in some instances, um, and yet we, we, we're glad but still don't feel fully included in the movement going forward. And so I, I'm just going to be honest, it's, it's this... Um, fight within my own head and heart of, yes, I want to support, I want to be there, I think I'm in a position where I can make a difference, um, but damn it, why wasn't anybody listening to people like me years ago? And, and, and I'm... And, well, and that's true. I think we've all experienced... I don't disagree with you. I think people weren't listening to me I mean, I think when we, we say, you know, we've all been in the boardroom or in the meeting where we've spoken up, no one paid attention to anything that we said, and then the next... You know, a guy said that, and all of a sudden, it's the best idea in the in the world. It's sort of that same um, dynamic. Well, and let's talk about agency. Um, the truth about agency is, people listen to white women more than they do to women of color. I mean, it, it's true. I, I really believe that. I believe strongly that it's when we started getting up and getting strong and saying it. We got the attention, and I think that's part of our agency as white women is that we need to remember that um, and amplify it and be responsible about it. I you know, that's a good point that I'm hearing. I mean, when we say we need to talk about the things that, like, you can't change if you don't see, for me, one of the nice things is I agree with all of this, but I almost feel like it's easier to hashtag me too, but at the same time, so I'm a criminal defense attorney and I'm in court all the time. I absolutely have unwillingly or implicitly participated in kind of the voice club culture because it's almost what I need to do to get the job done. So how do we move forward for that, right? And even from a legalistic perspective, if I want to bring a harassment claim, I have to make it known that the conduct is unwanted. Mm -hmm. How do you make it known that the conduct is unwanted when you are participating in it because it's what you've got to do to get it done? So I struggle with that daily because I agree. You know, I, it's, it's horrible, and I can only imagine that if I were a minority, I would feel it even more implicitly. I have a similar experience. Well, I think that's objecting to my maternity leave. Um, <laughs> but how, how, I think we have to address that to overcome it as well from a personal perspective. Um, and yeah, I think that's what the, the thing about what Falgany said is the vulnerability. As long as any of us feel vulnerable still in our jobs, in our place, or whatever else, we are going to do this calculation in our head of, can I say something? What are the consequences? And the fact that you even have to have that conversation in the head mean we haven't, means we haven't advanced as far as we need to. And so that, for me, gets back to there needs to be a total shift um, that could come from more women in leadership, less of the boys' club, but even still, there's still, to Falcony's point, there still could be that, well, I need to get along with whoever my boss is, regardless of their gender. What is that going to mean for me? But that's also not a personal failing per se, right? Mm -hmm. The part of this is, you know, I, we were talking about this, and I was actually thinking about this last night, but how many times do the men around us go, well, you're one of the boys. Yeah. Right? <laughs> you're one of the boys. You're not like other women. I mean, replace that term with you know, you're not like other Asians, you're not like other black people, right? That this is, this is a kind of, this is a kind of hailing of you to be complicit. It's about getting you to say, oh yeah, I'm cool. I'm like one of the boys. So that it, in fact, it almost pressures you to distance yourself from others who are not participating in that particular way. So it's not purely about failing, but, it, but there's a kind of structural pressure to do that. And so I think that's one of the things that's been important about this conversation is that I, I hope it is pushing many of us to look with maybe a jaundiced eye about the ways that we have been complicit or the ways we have participated, maybe by necessity. And I, I want to say particularly to white women, I think we really do need to challenge ourselves to look at ways we've benefited in particular, the times that we've been silent when we've seen our sisters of color, um, LGBTQ women, you know, not be... Um, treated with respect in the workplace and elsewhere. And, and that's something that I think um, really 
we need to bear in mind. You know, it is traumatic to be a woman in this world, right? We experience things that men don't have to, that wears on us in a pretty profound ways. All of that is compounded for women of color, for LGBTQ women, for women with disabilities, you know, basically women from other marginalized communities. So I would invite you to really reflect on that, that as much as this is painful for those of us who are white, magnify that significantly for women who do not share some of the same privileges that we do, and then ask yourself, what can I do to try and change that? Because I do think it's our obligation and responsibility. For me in the beginning, saying me too was a way to acknowledge my own pain. And then having to, what it felt like was I didn't get to acknowledge that because I needed to worry about a woman of color pain. And, and that's a really selfish, hard thing to accept about yourself. When you can step back, I think, and say to yourself, okay, so as a white woman, I've experienced this horrible experience. It doesn't take away that I'm acknowledging someone else had an even harder road than I did. And, and I find that if we stop for a minute, and, and I found it, I'm going to say I found your statement, me too, I was saying me too, that hits home for me. But the reality is it wasn't, it, it, it wasn't because of social media. Social media is not why the original Me Too hashtag did not move forward. Right, exactly. It was quite simply a black woman who mm -hmm. did not get the same level of respect that the white women are now getting. The white, beautiful actresses who were doing Time's Up are the ones who want to be like because society has told us that's who we should be like. And I just want to take a moment to ask all of us to stop and have those hard conversations with women of color and, and hear what they went through. The truth is, your road may have been hard. It doesn't take away from your road. But the reality is, someone can have had it much easier, more educated. I sit next to a woman every day who's more educated than I am, more experienced than I am, more intelligent than I am. But for our business sake, I will always be the face. And, and, and owning that and saying that out loud, I think, as white women, is how we start that conversation. And, and I think if we overlay class on it, I would really like, to, I really also think, let's talk about getting invisible. Let's add poverty or low income to it, and you were really invisible. And I think we have to ask really, and, and it's why some women get stuck in it. Man, they need that job. And in worse ways, they don't have that backstop. Um, you know, coming from certain classes, even me, I'm a first generation college student in my family, so much business goes on at the country club still, on the golf course still. Do not kid yourself, it has not changed. And then I think we have to ask hard questions like, I'm thrilled Atlanta Girls School and Padilla are here. I'm thrilled, but where are the kids from Washington and Douglas? Right? We should always ask those questions because they're the, really the forgotten, the left behind, the low income folks. Well, I think, I think that as particularly white women, we have, we have to acknowledge our privilege. You have to start there and then you have to say, okay, that doesn't, exactly what you said, doesn't take away from whatever things I've had to deal with. But I'm trying to have conversations with my friends who are women of color to ask this question. How can I be your ally? What is the thing that I, and by the way, I thought I was like woke and I was marching against the Vietnam War when I was 10 and blah, 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 blah. I'm a stereotypical upper middle class white left wing Jewish <laughs> activist. And yet, <laughs> and yet, I don't know jack shit. Yep. Um, and I will also say in public whatever comes in my head, so I'm not that person. Um, <laughs> I don't know anything about this because 
I get to walk around in this body. Mm -hmm. and, and that is where we have to start. We have to sit down with our friends of color and have those difficult conversations, which is, I hear you, tell me, because I want to understand, and then let's talk about how I can help. But it's also our... Let me, but it's also, and it's also about class. I want to bring yeah. this back oh, in a second. But it's oh. about our relationships to women that we hire, right? Yeah. The women who are doing, you know, house cleaning for us while we're at the office. And if they're being harassed by somebody in our family, are we going to actually take that person to task or are we also going to fire that woman, right? right? What is our relationship to those that we hire? In fact, and in women of color who have money are also complicit in this. Mm -hmm. employment situations, whether it be my colleague at my, my office, the women that we hire, I think it's incumbent upon us to create opportunities right. to engage with other women that mm -hmm. we wouldn't otherwise encounter in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, you know, with the, the saying, service is the rent that you pay for being here on earth. Make a concerted effort to get out in the community. If you believe that this is an issue, you know, it's great for us to have this conversation here. As Erin indicated, I'm having this conversation with Elizabeth, I'm having this conversation with Gwen, but I need to get out in the community. Those are the women that are without a, a voice. We're here, we're having this conversation, this is great, but what is our responsibility for getting out in the community and being the voice of those invisible individuals with respect to class? people that we would not normally have the opportunity to engage with in our day-to-day -day lives. I think that's where a lot of change and a lot of impact can be had. And you empower them sometimes simply by your presence mm -hmm. and the fact that you're willing to listen to their story and pick up on their story and be their voice. I think it's extremely important that we do that and I think it's amazing that we've got these young women here hearing the fact that in, in high schools that are hearing these types of things. I didn't have this opportunity when I was in high school, and I wish that I had. Nobody was talking about this one. Kim. Kim. I guess I was going to say a couple things. One thing about the Me Too hashtag, and I think I understand where you're coming from, but I think we could say technology wasn't as good back then. We can blame it on the technology. But more recently, when the opportunity was given to give credit right. to the person who started it, that still didn't happen. So then I say, we can say, OK, Let's give it to the technology part. But now when we're in present, when we can say this person started it, even then, forget what the cover was, Time. And she was left out. That's right. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think, you know, as a black Time. privileged black, both their lives are golden but I'm black and I'm privileged. I grew up upper middle class, I grew up with money, and I also grew up on the other side where my other side of my family had none. So mm -hmm. like you have that kind of experience of seeing what it looks like to grow up without a voice, or to grow up when you think you have a voice, but then you realize actually you don't have a voice. Because at, even though I'm privileged on one hand economically, I was still quite, I lacked a lot of agency and privilege because I was still the black person in the group that still had to fight against things. And so I think, I think having access, I think us as not as really thinking about class and, and race and what that looks like to people of color that aren't, or to individuals that aren't of color that don't have the, the means to put their voice out there, and, and really, and before we jump to, I guess my, if, if I'm being real, when, when you made the statement, I was like, I think you're not listening to it, though, right, like, like, I think it felt like it was like, but no, but me too, like, but I did it, and they, you know, I, it just didn't feel like it was, I think we have to focus on active listening, and really hearing, and I, I'm not, that's not a plain thing, right, just to, just to hear another person's perspective, take it in, and then figure out where, where am I in that situation to be able to affect more change from whatever my experiences were in the past. You know, and I totally hear you, and I'm actually in a very different position because I've been an amplifier and have very, you don't know, my, no one in this room knows my background, but I was asked to leave my high school in 1985 when I asked with black kids on my honor spot. So I, I, I what, it's not that, I'm just accommodating the technology is such an amazing thing that, that, that we've come to the same place. For the white woman, and I highly recommend, and the professor can, can tell me for the better book, but Ain't I a Woman by Bell Hooks is probably one of the best political philosophies on this very issue, exactly what you're talking about. So I don't want people to think that I'm not aware of where that whole thing, 
I was just making a statement where I think the confluence of time and space <coughs> came together and is forcing all of these conversations. And I was just making a statement. I wish I had known about the need to, I mean, but I didn't because I wasn't on Twitter in 2007. She was, but I think it, it was because you weren't on Twitter. I think it also was because a black woman started this. <laughs> right. Right. And I think right. that, so, that, that's the part. Like, I feel like, I agree, amazing that you did those things. But I think each of us, even myself, as a privileged black woman has to recognize there's some things my economic privilege doesn't allow me to always see. So I want to be able to hear someone that has that come from that level. And I'm not sure right. what you're saying. Yeah. You didn't have that I see one more hand. Melissa. I'll say this. Um, we were having a conversation this morning because I had the privilege of living in a neighborhood that was severely impoverished. But I had parents that were middle class parents. So I went to a private school where I was like, Two, there were like two black people. I was one of two, um, and so for me, I got to live in a place where I seen all of these people struggling, sometimes just to eat. And then I went to school in a place where people were building homes and their kids were making investments. And so I, I was telling Lori this morning, I, for me, it's been a lot easier for me to deal with the world because I haven't lost sight of the reality of where I grew up who those people turned out to be, and who I turned out to be as a result of being able to go somewhere else and get some education and get some different experiences, and then being at a crossroads in life where I can make a decision on which road I would go down. But I'm not naive, I'm not naive to the fact that everybody doesn't really get a choice. And I think I, I've heard different reporters, I've read books, and people say, you always have a choice. I've lived with people that don't get a choice. Exactly. And I think sometimes when we are dealing in everyday life, we assume you choose to eat that, you choose to look that way, you choose to go these places. And I think we have to be careful. People don't always have the greatest choice. They don't, sometimes they have to just survive. Sometimes they just have to push through. And so even when we're dealing in situations in our workplace, when we see things that we're not real sure if that's right or if it should be happening, I might be one paycheck away from being homeless. Mm -hmm. And if I stick up for you and I'm homeless, mm -hmm. are you going to take me in? Am mm -hmm. I going to be able to, is my family going to be right. able to come to your home and have dinner? Right. And I know in a, in a big, great, wonderful world, we want to feel like, man, if she's in trouble, I'm there. But the, the truth of the matter is, we all are trying to survive. Like, that's that's the truth. I think that we can address things in a way where people can hear us, and then I think we can address things in a way where we turn people off. And I see that happening all too many times. People get woke, and they go on this campaign, and they're throwing these flags up. When are you coming with me to the march? And, I'm, and, and a lot of times, I'm the person going, really? I mean, mm -hmm. there, there are better ways to, to, to make this point, there are better ways to move forward that doesn't always mean setting the house on fire. And so I see one extreme or the other, which is, you know, that's what's concerning to me. It's either I say nothing or I want to burn the house down. I think this is, this is a great place. Um, that, that really brought a lot of the things that we've been talking about together and, and to the next point that I wanted to, to bring up, which is we've been talking about our vulnerability, right? We're talking about how it's not always there's not an equal playing field about how much I can speak up, right? Because there's different things at stake. So with that in mind, with different vulnerabilities in mind, what does it mean to bring your authentic voice into the workplace? Is there an authentic voice that you can bring? Um, one of the things Aaron and I talked about in planning for today was about was code switching. So there's a new NPR podcast called Code Switching. So that's getting that term is getting a lot of play these days. It's about knowing two different languages and being to switch back and being able to switch back and forth between them, sometimes even unconsciously. Um, and, and for women, that's being able to speak to them in the men's world and in, speak men's language and women's language for different races and different, you know, for all kinds of different minorities, races, immigrants, all kinds of different people, code switching means a lot of different things, right? So um, can we speak to that, that piece about being in the workplace, having different vulnerabilities, needing to survive? Um, so where, where can we bring our authentic voice? And how maybe, you know, for the counselor here, how can we practice when we do have the opportunity to bring our authentic voice? And in, in, in with the goal being 
if you can hear my authentic voice, like we're hearing authentic voices today, then you can see something you didn't see before. So, talk amongst yourselves. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be quiet now is what that meant. Go. I'm going to respond to um, the notion of code switching, and I think it's unclear to me when I hear people speaking about that, whether there's a suggestion that being able to code switch and being authentic are binary, mm -hmm. that you've got to be one or the other. Mm -hmm. My experience is the most effective women are the ones who can combine the two, that can speak the language of whomever their audience is, and frankly, as a mother, I try to do that with my teenagers, right? But, but in a boardroom, you've got to be able to speak the language to be part of the conversation. And it doesn't mean you sacrifice yourself in doing that. So I, I just want to be careful that how we, how we are defining code switching and if we're suggesting that it is you know, something negative or dirty in all contexts, I think that's, that's misleading, and I think it is counterproductive for women who are trying to be present and trying to have a voice for change. I, I actually think that um, <coughs> over time you can become integrated. I, I think that, I do believe that you can know the different codes and come from different places, but begin to merge them all in, um, in how you interact. I, I, I really do. Um, I also think that mentorship can help women in this regard. Um, be, if, you're, if you're concerned, am I being too authentic? Can I, you know, what should I say? How should I do it? To speak to other women and to have mentors that are men as well. Um, so, so that they can help you understand how it may or may not be perceived and it might offer a great opportunity for you to do some educating as well when you're interacting with them. Um, for years when I negotiated salaries guys, I went to my male friends and I ran it by them and I ran by how I was going to present it and how I was going to talk about it. You know, eventually I got tired of doing it and started my own firm, but, you know, for, <laughs> but for a long time, because it, it, is, it is very different and um, it can be a different way. It's how I learned to begin to speak in one language. Yeah, I think one piece of it is how, what, how are we defining authentic? Does it mean saying exactly what's on your mind the first way that it pops into your head? Or does it mean speaking your truth in a way that is more likely to be heard by your audience? And I guess I would advocate it's more, more the latter. Um, you know, when Erin and I were talking about uh, one of the challenges that a lot of women face, and that is how do you respond to a comment made by a male colleague that seems inappropriate to you? And of course, maybe the, the first thing that comes to my head is like, are you kidding me? I can't believe that just came out of your mouth, but I'm not going to say that because that's probably not going to get me very far. So one of the um, possibilities that you might consider is to get curious about it and just ask questions about, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm fully with you. Can you say more about that? You know, what, what did you mean when you said such and such? Because I'm, I'm not really clear about that. That is, I think, authentic because I truly do want to hear what you meant by that. Um, but by asking questions in ways that our, uh, the male speaker might not get super defensive and shut down, it's more likely to lead to a productive conversation. Still my truth, and, and depending on what he says, I'm going to then respond to it. But can we set the stage for a productive conversation while being true to ourselves? Yeah. And I, I think one of the important things that comes up with code switching um, is, this, is this notion that a lot of younger women um, who I get to work with and mentor, it always comes up this question of like, well, I want to be taken seriously. That there seems to be this notion that if we're speaking, if we're friendly, right, or we're, we're, if I put an exclamation point in that email, like I, I want to make sure that they're taking my opinion seriously. And I think that that's one of the spaces that we want to explore of, well, can't we, 
shouldn't the assumption be that we will be taken seriously? And it's not necessarily such a focus on how we're presenting. Um, and I think that that may be some of where we get that conversation of women who are managers. Well, they're so shrill, right? And they're, and they're responding in this way that we put this idea in our own heads that we shouldn't be taken seriously and we have to be saying it a certain way in order for it to be received by our audience. Um, and that may, be, may or may not be correct, um, but, I, but I think that it's worth an area that we should be thinking about when we're in that position and when we do doubt ourselves about, am I saying this the right way that someone will listen to me? They should be listening to you if you're talking. Um, and how do we make sure that we, we can communicate with men <laughs> as effectively as women um, when we do have important ideas to share? I mean, I, I have to say, I'm, I, I guess when I hear the, the phrase code switching, I mean, you know, again, sorry, academic. Um, historically, I mean, this is this is this is something that was used by indigenous populations to kind of move back and forth within their communities, and then to talk to settlers, and you know, it was a military strategy. But code switching is also about power, right? It's about trying to find the best strategic way to have yourself heard. So it's not about whether or not, you know, it's not so much about authenticity. I mean, I think the stuff about authenticity is actually quite problematic because it's a way of kind of making us feel bad for the things that we do. <laughs> so I don't like the language of, we're always authentic, no matter, I mean, part of it is how we're perceiving who we are and in whatever situation there is. But code switching is also about like, you know, you're asking whether or not you're being taken seriously because your concern is that you are on the wrong side of power on that one. Right? That's, that's part of why people code switch. If you can integrate code switching, what that actually means is that you are in a position to have these so-called choices, that you can make those kinds of decisions about integrating and taking somebody to task or to say, well, I'm not sure what you mean. I mean, part of it is if you're not in that position, you're always kind of trying to figure out how to get under those comments, right, or how to get behind them. So, you know, I do think that we have to keep that particular aspect in mind as well. Mm -hmm. Let me ask a question. Oh, yay. wouldn't want to stop code switching because it causes unity in my community. Like, I can agree with her, oh, I would never say this one word. But I can still say it in front of you because you are you. And I feel like I would only wish to integrate it if I was CEO of some company because I would honestly hire people who code switch in their past. If that makes sense. So I was wondering if it's wrong of me to not want to stop. No, no. And I, I think, um, oh yeah, so uh, she eloquently said, and she's using her power, which I think is phenomenal, she doesn't want to have to code switch. She sees the benefit of being able to communicate across different lines, and when she's CEO of her own company, that's when, um, you said you'll require others to code switch to be able. Well, she doesn't want to well, stop. Code switch. Want to stop. Code she don't want to stop. stop. Even when she's in power, she doesn't want to stop code switching because it um, keeps your community tight. I mean, for me, this goes back to the, one of the the foundational things. This is why diversity is important, right? Because one, you would hope that you would have a diverse enough environment that you wouldn't have to code switch because you are all being your authentic selves and that authenticity and that uniqueness is what is valued. Um, now that may not be where we are uh, today, but to me it just underlines the point that as long as we are, to, to uh, Fulgani's point, um, Fulgani's point, as long as we're worried about what the other person thinks, we're trying to adapt into a world that I don't know why we're putting ourselves through those motions. I mean, I guess I know why we're doing it. We talked about it earlier in terms of being vulnerable and what do we lose. But as long as you're having that calculation, we have not achieved the, uh, the, the status that we're looking for. Uh, and so that, again, bring me, brings me back to in the, the places that I've been where the environment is more diverse, you are more comfortable with, you can code switch, but not have that tinge of, oh my gosh, I just, why am I saying it this way based on my audience? It's, I'm saying it because that's the way I want to be heard as opposed to being concerned about how the other person hears me. I just want to make an observation. In corporate America, um, 
I think we're always looking to speak the language of those that are at the highest levels of power. And that's true whether you are a male or a female. So that's why I, I struggle a little bit with sort of the, the code switching. And, and I liked your description of it's strategic, you know, as opposed to something that we're somehow failing ourselves right. or we're being inauthentic if we're code switching. You know, here's the thing, whether, you know, you're a male or a woman and you're walking in and you're pitching something to the leadership team, you've got to sell them what they want to buy. And the way you do that is to speak the language. So I, you know, I, I think there's a, a practical tension that exists. You do it with a jury, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say something about this panel and the as thinking about internal changes that we need to make, I think our own authenticity isn't necessarily the right question to ask. I agree that what we do when we code switch is an effort to operate in another world while being authentic. But looking at it the other way is that when we talk about starting conversation, conversations and listening to other women and marginalized populations, I think we need to think about what those other codes are in other communities mm -hmm. and try to begin to understand that by having those conversations. And I think that kind of understanding is really the only way that we can start to make change within ourselves. Because um, I know for me, um, I feel like there was, ever since I was a kid, there was code switching between I lived in a place that was rural, and I lived in a place that was mostly white. Um, and when I moved from a rural place to a city, when I went from population to population, um, and my parents were working class, they worked in a restaurant. So when I moved into this profession, every time I've made a move, even if it's just to go to another school, there's been a need to code switch but there hasn't been a need for other people to try to understand that of me. So I think starting those conversations with people who are unlike us to understand that is a good way to start doing our own work. And there's a question. Question back. First of all, I think it's great we're having the conversation because it needs to be had. Um, I absolutely think that you're going to have to code switch. I agree with the ladies from corporate America. I've tried hundreds of cases. You have to be able to relate to juries. Because I practice in Fulton County, my juries come from Alpharetta, and they're primarily white, and they're very wealthy, and they're very educated. And then I'm also talking to people in other parts of the county. I live in South Fulton and College Park, and they don't have the same means. And so my whole career has been translating to people. Um, I always say you have to be able to talk to PhDs and no Ds and make them all get the same message. Um, if you're black and an attorney, you're going to have to code switch. I have news for you. If you're a woman and an attorney, you're going to have to code switch because what's the point in talking if your audience cannot hear you? Um, so I think that, that that is just natural. Now, code switching doesn't mean to me, though, that you can't be authentic. And I think we're saying it in a way where the two things are mutually exclusive. When I walk in this room, everyone knows I'm a black woman. Uh, I look like a black woman, my intonation is of a black woman, but that doesn't mean I can't use the King's English, or I can't choose, because I'm educated, football terminology, or whatever it is, because my point is to win, and if it's to win, I need to speak in your language, but still be myself. Um, I don't know your name. What is your name? Shelly. I loved her point about asking a question. Um, I've been practicing 22 years. Sorry for the men in the room. Men are going to say stupid things to you. <laughs> it's going to happen throughout the course of your career. Um, one thing I hear that's always as a black woman, and I always use your strategy, is you don't look like a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried more cases than you, probably four times as many. My degree is from Emory, I can assure you I owe them a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> but I still get that question, and so I always ask, really? Well, what does a lawyer look like? And at that question, they immediately begin to realize what they said was kind of silly. Um, I've also had men say to me, and 
so have most women in this room, and they've been white men and black men and Asian men. Things that are just inappropriate sexually. Things about the way I looked that day. Um, things that just, well, why was it necessary for the conversation for you to say? Other than men, I think always kind of like to show you that they're still men and they know this. Um, but it's not necessarily something I wanted to receive that day. Um, and I typically don't attack them for doing it. I was raised by a man. I don't know if it gives me a, another, I mean, exclusively my single parent was a man. Um, but I tend to do your strategy of like, I'm going to do this. And I think it takes them back to asking the question. Um, but I also want to know, everybody in this room is educated, and whether you want to be or not, you're a leader. Um, and so you have to, um, by the way you live your life, show example. Um, some women, honestly, they try to move themselves ahead by being sexual, and you know what I mean. Um, and it, that's the one thing in life that makes me cringe when I see women trying to advance themselves in that way. I've watched it in courtrooms and boardrooms and meetings. Um, don't conduct yourself like that because younger lawyers are looking at you. Um, and so I would just say that we have to watch the way we conduct ourselves and you don't know how important it is when you talk to the trash lady. You Just by acknowledging that you see her, whether she's Spanish or black or whatever, that she has significance, because you don't realize she is looking at you in your big office and you are her story of success. Um, and so I just think we really have to watch the way we conduct ourselves, but I commend you all for having this, because I think that white women and black women, quite frankly, are going through a lot of the same experiences, where it may be amplified, um, you're still a woman with women parts, and so you're still going to all have some of the very similar experiences. Thank you. I want to get this question from the audience. What advice do you have for young women combating sexual harassment? I'm a teenager following the Me Too movement, but how do we change the unfair power dynamic between men and women in society? And how do we react towards leadership that consists of people who do not acknowledge this problem? Does anybody from the panel want to take a stab at that? Shelley? That's a big one. <laughs> I mean, that's why we're here, right? Uh, right, it is the ultimate question. And, and that is why I think it's so important that we start having these conversations in our personal lives. Because we all have men in our lives, I would assume, in some capacity. And I'm not saying we don't have the power to make change. We sure do. It's going to take the, the partnership of our male allies as well to really change things. Um, and so I think one of the ways we can use our agency is to initiate those conversations with men who do have access, or a platform, I should say, that maybe we don't always have. Um, help them to figure out how they can challenge their colleagues' inappropriate statements, how they can support women at all levels in the places that they exist in the world. Um, but I, 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 again, I don't want this to be heard as there's nothing we can do, but I think that's a powerful thing. J just like when a, a white woman chooses to use her voice to amplify that of a woman of color, right? It's not to say she doesn't have a voice. It's like, how can I walk with you on this journey to lift you up? And I think when it comes to um, the Me Too movement, we got to have men walking alongside of us in order to affect cultural change. the very top, which sometimes that's just a hard uh, person to, to get to crack or whatever. I think, like you said, in our personal lives, and it might be our brother, our uncle, our cousin, that can we can start having these conversations with, that then can lead to, you know, if, you know, changes if we're similar age in school to maybe a couple more of their friends, and that can kind of filter out to a large community. So while I, I, I think I, I've always hoped to change um, folks at the top, sometimes I can't get there. So what's my next best effort to try to change people that are immediately around me? And so if you're, if you're in school, maybe it's like your friends, having that conversation with, with your friend groups that maybe because then when they go back into the locker room, they can have it with their friends and then that can spread like, you know, as, as a way to make smaller changes incrementally. I think it's easy to, I remember as a teenager I wanted to change the world all at once and I still want to change the world a lot, but I really believe that it is one relationship at a time. That guy friend of yours may be the director of human resources hiring people and the conversations you have with him now 
right? Him as a future leader and you as a future leader can impact, have a, have a rippling effect on society. So I think that's really important. I also think, and as a teenager, this probably makes no sense, we need to raise good men. We can impact this world by the men that we raise and how we raise them. That's a great point, and it brings me to another line item on my list of things I wanted to get these ladies to respond to, which is um, promoting and supporting other women. So you're talking about a, a structural thing, uh, like something you can bring into the workforce to help men understand how to promote, promote and support other women. We could also talk about women. Are we promoting and supporting other women? So I want to put both of those things out there because I think part of what we want to do today is talk about the things that, that we can take with us. So if that is, you know, training, if that's um, um, better practices to support when we have a position of power to bring, bring the people up with us, just putting that out there about how do we support and promote other women to change the boardroom. So I want to challenge all of the women, and the young women too especially, to ask yourselves whether you are doing as much as you can to ask for the help, to ask for the mentoring, to ask for the feedback. I will tell you, in corporate America, it is not um, the most comfortable thing to be able to ask somebody for feedback about what you're doing well and what you could do better and what changes you might make to make yourself more valuable to your leader, to your department, to the corporation. But the people who do that create relationships and create a safe space where people feel comfortable giving you information that is critical to your success. So if you're not doing that, if you haven't thought about whether you need to do that, I'm telling you the best way to control your own destiny is not to be afraid to ask for feedback and when you get it, treat it as a gift, accept it like an adult, think about it, and factor that into how you're continuing to evolve in your day to day. I can't tell you how many times in the courtroom I've had female judges. When I had a female opposing counsel say, would y'all please stop your cat fight? Mm. I'm, I kid you not. Or, Miss Smith, you don't need to get so emotional. Um, so one thing I would tell you you could do is those people need to be voted out of office. <laughs> um, and women, just like men, and be ruthless about it. Give your money. I don't care if you're given a dollar, you get an allowance every week. But give your money to those candidates that represent your values. And the other thing is if you have organizations, manage them in a way that reflects what you value. How you implement maternity leave, right? Make sure in your organization people don't get off track just because they have babies. Um, if you believe health care is a human right, Make it a human right in your organization. If you believe people, women, all people should have a clear path to partnership, do that. We've got to model organizations are, you know, a lot of law firms and corporate America, they're just doing the same old thing because it's what everybody's used to. Do it differently, um, do it honorably, and do it in a way that reflects what you value. 
I think a piece of that also is um, asking for feedback. So I might have some great ideas for what I think would be supportive to the women that I work with, but I might not know all the things. And so particularly for those of us who are in positions, positions of power, ask the women that you work with or the women you interact with, how can I be helpful? What would feel supportive to you? How can I help you to advance? Because I'm guessing she's going to know best about what she needs. I agree with that, and one of the other things that, that we've started to do in, in my firm is use our lean-in circle, which is a women's support group. It covers the entire spectrum of folks. It's not just lawyers. It's not just partners. Um, it, it's everybody within the firm, so we're trying to make sure that when we're inclusive, we do mean everybody. But then using that, much like the hashtag Me Too, to be the voice for those that may not feel comfortable raising issues. Uh, and make sure that the folks that are making decisions in the firm know these aren't isolated incidents and they don't just affect one person. That basically by the power of our collective voice as partners or whatever else, we are going to make you to listen to everybody in the firm regardless of whether you think um, they either should be heard or not. We are telling you that they should be just because they are members of our, our family, our firm family. Right, let's do one and then the other. Let's do behind you and then come to, come to you, okay? So back here. So I'm so excited that we're all in this room and having this conversation because, as several people have mentioned, these are conversations that we have with maybe some of our peers but not others, and they're conversations that maybe we're not always comfortable having. And my question is how we can have a more receptive ear and let people know that our ears are receptive. And what I mean by that is there's been many instances in my life where I truly wanted to hear and understand someone else's voice. And I was met with the sort of response of, well, you're not me, and you're not in my situation, and you won't understand. And this has come from women who are in older generations than me, where they fought their battles and they feel like their struggle is different. It's come from minorities whose struggle is different. But I, I truly do want to understand, and I'm often, I often feel like, you know, maybe, maybe someone is self-censoring because they think I won't understand. But how can I let people know, I really do want to hear you. I want to understand what you're saying and your situation so that we can work together. I think that just goes back to what Meg said earlier in terms of relationships. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it was Dawn that, that talked about, it's just that one-on-one -on -one you got to establish the trust first before folks will open up their heart and history um, to you. So it may be approaching them on uh, a less poignant level. Hey, what'd you do this weekend? You know, do you have something common in terms of both of you have kids on the soccer field at the same time? I mean, it's those incremental, just general questions about how you are today, uh, what's going on in your life today, that will then open up the door to, hey, what did you experience? How did you get here? I think another piece is just to own that, to state it up front. My experience is really different from yours, and that's why I really want to learn. Because I think sometimes people respond that way because they think, oh, well, you're just you know, going to assume that your experience is universal, and so therefore you wouldn't be able to get my experience. So sometimes when we can just name the elephant in the room, that helps to um, deflate some of its power. Can, yes, I want to go back. I'm going to do a couple more because I see hands. So to you and then back of the room. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so we co-founded a club called Millennium Matters, and we work with girls to so let me help them become advocates. And oftentimes we're 
our opinions are seen as invalid outside of school. So what can we do as teenagers to, um, outside of conversation, make sure that changes happen so that when we go into the workplace, we're taken more seriously? What was the name of your organization? Melon Matters. Mm -hmm. okay. Melon. 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 Melon Matters is the na name of their organization. And the question was, how do they, they feel as though they're not being heard or not being taken seriously. And so they want to make sure, the question is, how can they, how can that voice be heard? Uh, and part of me is like, y'all are going to be running the world soon enough. <laughs> and I'm so glad for that. Um, I guess the one thing I would say is keep plugging because the fact that someone isn't listening now is their issue. It's not yours. You have stepped up, you have taken uh, or exhibiting the kinds of courage that I think many of us wish we had when you were our age. And the fact that you have it now means that you will surpass any place that we currently are, you know, 30 years or more older than you. Um, so don't give up. Keep plugging. We will be your voice. I think Gall will be your voice. There, anything you need from this organization or really any member of the bar. Uh, if this is the path that you want, then by all means connect with us and we will make sure that your voices get heard. And then sit back and just revel in the fact that you'll be speaking for us soon enough. Get three email addresses. Each of you get three email addresses or social media addresses and let us know what your opinions are and let us say, hey, you might try saying it this way, or gee, I'd never thought of that. You're teaching me something. But it's just not going to happen, so reach out. And it's also about cultivating relationships. So I don't know what the context is that you're thinking of where your voice wasn't heard, but let's just say you're trying to get somebody to make a contribution to your organization. Well, it may be that someone in this room knows the CEO of that organization or knows someone who sits on the board. So as you develop relationships with women like us who can mentor you, uh, we can help brainstorm our connections and say, okay, maybe we can sort of introduce you so, to say you should hear these young women um, and take them seriously. So it is about cultivating the relationships that we've talked about several times, I think. And I, I think also don't be afraid to ask and reach out for help. Um, we did this uh, amazing exercise a couple months ago where we challenged people in the room to ask the unreasonable thing. And so often we in our own minds think that the things that we have to ask are unreasonable. So when I was putting this panel together, I reached out to all the women in my network and I was like, we need you know, the best, the smartest, um, the most influential women. Um, and that seemed like an unreasonable ask for me, but it, it wasn't, as it turns out, so hard for other people. It wasn't unreasonable to other people. So don't be the person in your head who says, well, I can't ask that. I can't ask that of those people. They don't want to help because let them tell you no. You shouldn't be the first one to tell yourself no. That's too much to ask. Ask, and they say no, they say no, and ask the next person. So we're going to take this last question because we're about the time, correct? Okay. Yes. One last question. Thank you. That's the last thing. <laughs> Back, and I think it's been very interesting with our conversation about code switching and then about mentorship with other women, is um, putting that element of privilege and class back into it. And I think that, at least for me, um, coming into the legal community, and I'm a 3L right now at GSU, um, my family isn't lawyers, my family doesn't come from that background, and learning the actual parts of being a lawyer that I'm supposed to perform as both as my gender and how to perform as just an attorney, not necessarily a female attorney has been a difficult journey overall. And I think that we put the emphasis on young women in particular to ask for mentors or ask to learn how to do this, but a lot of times, like, when you're not necessarily in a position of power, I think that's a little bit harder, or you might not even know what invisible social norms we're following or not following. So I think that's an important piece of the conversation that I just wanted to add to it, and I don't know if any of you panelists have a personal experience in that regard. But um, I think that sometimes it's, uh, it's important for us to recognize, too, that the ability to just switch into the legal culture isn't something that everyone understands and maybe or has. Any final thoughts, panelists? No, I, I would agree with you. Um, my personal experience was I was the daughter of a firefighter and a nurse. And when I went to law school, I was hearing language that I had never heard before. <coughs> And my, you know, my parents were working class, so they, they were not sophisticated with respect to business concepts. We didn't talk about the stock market at home, and we didn't talk about mergers and acquisitions or any of those things. 
And when I got to law school, a number of my classmates um, had parents who were partners in big firms in Washington, D.C. And, and other things. And this language was just intuitive for them. And, and conceptually, they were able to participate in class in a way that made me feel sort of discouraged and underdressed. Um, but, you know, 22 years later, I think I'm doing okay for myself. So I would say don't be discouraged. It's not where you start, it's where you finish. And, you know, your life experience may put you in a position where you have to maybe work harder to learn new concepts that are familiar to other people, but it doesn't mean that you can't ultimately um, be in control of your own destiny and be fabulously successful. Thank you. Any other burning, burning final thought? If not, we will wrap yep. this panel up and have a short break. We're going to take a quick break. Now, as we said at the beginning, part of the benefit of today is not only getting better, smarter, and newer ideas, um, but also we're all in the same room at the same time, like physically here, not just on social media. So we have these amazing women in the room. They're here. Please, like, take this moment on the break. This is about new connections as well. Um, we're all here. We're all interested in the same thing. So make those connections and introduce yourself to someone you may not already know. So with that, uh, let's take about a 10-minute break. Come back here at quarter up. Then I love the idea that